Sustainable Connections, a podcast connecting ambition to action, is brought to you by ERM, the world's largest peer play sustainability consultancy. In this podcast, host Mark Lee, director of the Sustainability Institute by ERM, speaks with some of the most innovative and boundary pushing minds in the field, examining the connections necessary to make sustainable business a reality across sectors and systems and up and down organizations. Topics cover the breadth of the sustainability agenda, including net zero, nature positive, biodiversity, equity, resources and frameworks, and more. This is Sustainable Connections. Welcome everyone to this next episode of the Sustainable Connections podcast. I'm Mark Lee. I'm the director of the Sustainability Institute by ERM. So the podcast has been designed to bring forward some of the boundary pushing minds in the field, some of the brave folks, the pioneers who are doing some of the kinds of collaborating, thinking, partnering, accelerating, scaling that is needed to bring about the kind of economy and world that we all want. I'm here today with Elizabeth Sturkin, who's the Managing Director of Corporate Partnerships at the Environmental Defense Fund. You'll probably hear us say EDF a lot during the course of the call. And specifically, she sits within EDF plus business. And Elizabeth, first, just hello and welcome. So I'm Elizabeth Sturkin, and I run the Net Zero Program and Business Partnerships at Environmental Defense Fund, or as you mentioned, EDF plus business. Thanks for having me and inviting me to your brand new podcast. I'm super excited to speak with you today. We're so glad to have you here. And I've already said there's EDF and there's EDF plus business. And you sit in a particular part of the larger organization. Can you tell me how those things fit together, what each of them is? Climate change is the challenge and the opportunity of our lifetimes. And it's clear that the actions that companies take in the next years, eight years in particular, will determine whether or not we meet our climate targets and also prevent catastrophic damages to our planet or not. We are really at a really critical juncture. And the good news is that we are taking action to transition to a clean energy economy, and that is a massive economic opportunity. So we see innovative business leadership as a crucial driver to net zero progress at scale. It sounds like you're right person with right role at right time. Um, I've watched EDF for a long time. I've sometimes had direct opportunity to engage you and your colleagues kind of in the field, working alongside EDF at a couple of companies um, and seeing the great work that you publish and, and the things that you convene. One of the things I see is that EDF uh, seems unique among environmental organizations for the depth and the quality of its private sector partnerships. And there are lots of fantastic environmental organizations doing amazing work, but they don't all emphasize that engagement with the private sector. Why is that such a constituent part of EDF? Historically, business and environmental organizations were seen as adversaries and EDF was founded in the 1960s during the era of environmental laws. The EPA was just created, and it was really a scrappy band of lawyers working to save the Osprey. And ultimately, we were pursuing a legal strategy to uh, ban DDT. EDF's informal motto at that time was, sue the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Our formal, formal motto is finding the ways that work. And I think that speaks to the transition that's happened at EDF over the years. We really have uh, relentlessly focused on results. And to do that just came a, a time when we realized you must engage with business as the engine of the economy and that businesses are creating products and services to serve people's needs. And being in an adversarial relationship um, didn't always make sense that maybe you could make more progress by working to together directly and partnering. So that was really where this came from. EDF was the first environmental group in the US to partner with a company. It was the original partnership with McDonald's, which was all about 
waste reduction. McDonald's was being picketed because of their wasteful practices and the toxics in their packaging. And our president at the time, who's still our president, Fred Krupp, thought we could make more progress by talking to them and working directly with them. So, you know, ultimately, uh, our, that first partnership with McDonald's set the template for our work going forward. And some of those core principles really have remained with our work with companies to this day. And that is first, a focus on results. Second, a focus on replicability that what we learn in that partnership, we are able to take and spread and create ripple effects of change. And then also that we don't take money directly from the companies that we work with and we haven't in the past in the United States. Um, we're adjusting as our, as our model becomes global, but I think that's been a core part of what's made EDF unique. I love those snapshots of the history. I have to say, it seems to me that both the informal motto, sue the bastards, very appropriate for the time, and yet the evolution to finding the way that works, which may you know, occasionally still require legal action and suing, is so much better suited to the incredible complexity of the landscape we face today. We need to find so many ways that work. Um, so you know, you sort of gave us the little McDonald's snapshot, a hint of EDF partnerships over time. I know you've been in and led some of those partnerships on EDF's behalf. I think you embedded almost with Walmart for the better part of a decade. Whether it's Walmart or something else, can you tell us a little bit more about one of the partnerships that you've been right in yourself? I wanted to start really with um, the first big successful partnership that I had, which was working together with FedEx to come up with their next generation vehicle. Um, we came up with the idea that um, you know FedEx, if they put out a demand signal for a much cleaner truck that um, worked the same and performed the same, um, but just was much better in terms of greenhouse gases and other pollutants, that you know maybe the market would respond. And the market did respond, and you know really that project was responsible for getting a next generation vehicle on the road faster than market forces alone would have done. You know, and I still see some of those FedEx trucks driving around San Francisco and I'm very proud about that. But it also was this realization at the end of that project, um, which as I said, was super successful in many ways, was, oh my God, this is not enough. <laughs> It took six years for that whole project. And, you know, that was, it was a hybrid truck. And so therefore not even the ultimate end technology that was zero emissions that we needed. So there was a realization, I think for me personally, but for us organizationally, and maybe for many others in the field, I'm sure you probably have had those pivot moments too, Mark, where you just thought, well, I've done great work and it needs to be so much more. And that was really what I came to. And so, you know, from then on, I think the focus was really much more on, okay, where do we have the leverage to create massive change that can, can really address planetary challenges? And I was just coming back from maternity leave when I heard about some, um, uh, private meetings in the basement of a inn in Fayetteville, Arkansas, with the CEO of Walmart, um, where he met with a bunch of other NGOs. Um, none of the other NGOs would, would talk publicly about it afterwards. <laughs> I was coming back from maternity leave, and I'm like, oh my God, Walmart it wants to get serious about sustainability. That's going to be big. And so I jumped all in on that. And really EDF jumped all in on working with Walmart. We were their first environmental group partner. And so they set very three very ambitious sustainability goals of 100% renewable energy, create zero waste, and sell 
products that sustain people on the planet. Really ambitious goals, aspirational goals. So EDF jumped in and became Walmart's first partner and did a variety, we've done a variety of projects over the years with them. So the, the issue areas where we worked with Walmart over the years uh, ranged from uh, sustainable seafood to solar energy, um, some important game-changing things like getting Walmart to set the first supply chain carbon reduction goal as a retailer, which ultimately became Project Gigaton. Um, and you know, clearly that has massive ripple effects. And so this the, the work that we've done on chemicals and chemicals and consumer products uh, was game changing and it set the leadership bar in that space. Um, and you know the, honestly, Mark, the thing that I'm probably most proud of is the fact that you know, now on chemicals, many other retailers have maybe even exceeded Walmart and on, other NGOs have jumped in and are working with Walmart. And it's like the whole thing has exploded in a really good way. And there's really good positive competition for environmental and uh, sustainability progress. That's perfect in that it's so what I believed I saw all these years from EDF that you you look almost for the biggest lever possible that you could pull to try and solve the problem. And so your FedEx story just made me think, you know, where's the biggest fleet? And it was hybrids. And I remember those early announcements and just being almost shocked at the news coming out of Bentonville and that the world's biggest retailer was taking this step. And you characterize it as now every retailer does it. It's normalized. One interesting story of the impact of Walmart and what they have done and and how you you have that leverage and the ripple effect was a conversation I had not too long ago with someone at Unilever. Unilever is widely acknowledged to be one of the premier leaders on sustainability. This everyone knows this. And um he told me, he said, you know, I was in the audience when Lee Scott made that first speech in 2005, and that had a direct impact on our company and got us on this journey. So, you know, it, it, it's, it just shows the power of the big lever. So we have many challenges still in business and supply chains and with elements in products to be sure, but there is a whole different way of thinking about them. And I think we can see the legacy of that work in a whole bunch of places. Um, you talked about time and, and that one of your lessons of working individually with companies was that as much as you can do, it's kind of also, I guess, limited to the one entity. And I know right now you're in the course of launching a net zero accelerator, which is for many companies. And there's so much conversation around net zero right now uh, thousands of targets being set, probably more than that, but thousands of kind of official and science-based target aligned and getting to a scale there. One other learning mark from my 25 years of doing this work with companies is that if they set ambitious goals and they follow through by incorporating sustainability into the business, that the positive business benefits are so great. And by positive business benefits, I mean cost savings, I mean public relations benefits, I mean employee engagement, customer engagement, I mean supply chain risk reduction. And I'm not saying that things do, this doesn't cost money. What I'm saying is the positive business benefits are so great that they become this flywheel and enable the company to step up and do more. So you talked about the nuts or accelerator and this is the challenge, right? Mark, you have a lot of companies who are realizing they need to act on climate. And as individuals, you know, we can't escape it anymore. Companies are a lot more data driven than politicians a lot of times. And so they realize they need to they need to act. Many have set goals, sustainability goals, and 
then they're figuring they're, they're at this point of, okay, well, how do we actually do this, right? This is hard work. It's complex work. That was the idea behind the Nets or Accelerator. And we really do see a gap between commitments and progress. Only 20% of published corporate net zero goals meet the minimum requirements of the Race to Zero campaign. And Climate Action 100 Plus found that only 17% of the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitting companies have developed quantified strategies to achieve their climate goals. We work together with ERM to research the needs for an accelerator and interviewees and survey respondents were asked about their climate commitments, the obstacles that they were facing, and then the type of support they would need to help catalyze action. So the description of the moment that we're at, uh, Elizabeth, you know, we've, we've got everybody setting goals and it, it is the right thing to do. You know, we need people to kind of establish an ambition and then pursue it. And they have to disclose and tell us how they're going to get there and make sure that they build trust along the way by, by demonstrating that they're genuinely moving forward. And we had an opportunity as you were starting to conceive the accelerator for ERM to help research the needs that the accelerator might serve. So we did a host of interviews with dozens of companies uh, headquartered all in North America. We wanted to know, you know, what they were up against and how ultimately the accelerator could help them overcome them. So what did they say? Maybe what was a surprise? And how is the accelerator thinking about providing what they need? Mark, a lot of what we heard sounded very familiar. And there, it, it's a daunting challenge if you've set an ambitious sustainability goal, an ambitious climate goal, to actually achieve it and to know where to start and what to do. Companies reported three key internal barriers um, the first was the strategy itself, um, understanding how to develop and deliver a climate strategy that connects those climate goals with the broader business objectives and then actually drives progress by incentivizing action. The second was organization. Um, the, the, the challenge every organization faces in doing anything that involves change, right? It's how, in this case, it's how do you integrate climate action into the organization? Um, and if you can't, you're not going to achieve your goal. And the third was value chain and scope three. So companies are really finding it very challenging both to measure that kind of those kind of value chain and scope three emissions, but then in particular, then what to do, how to manage them. If you've got a complex value chain, how do you engage your suppliers? How do you uh, affect emissions that are down the supply chain? So that's a, a, a third key internal barrier. They also reported facing three key external barriers, some of which are already dissipating. The first is policy and regulation. Companies say that more governmental support was necessary, is necessary. Um, clearly in the United States, we've made a huge leap forward with some of the recent climate legislation from the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, the Infra Infrastructure Bill, to be, to be uh, held up for one example, but policy and regulation, definitely a global challenge. Those are systems, there are systems challenges that need um, policy engagement and regulation. The second key external barrier is technology. Companies state that the technological solutions needed to achieve their climate goals are not yet available at scale or at all. I want to flag that EDF is producing a Pathways to Net Zero report focused on the innovation imperatives, which talks about some of this and focuses on actions that companies can do and uh, um, advocacy that they can do to try and meet and close that net zero gap. So technology is the second key external barrier. And the third one is simply Tools and guidance. Companies suggest that uncertainty on which climate rate related tools and guidance are right for them limits the scale of their action. 
they just need to know how to do it and they need to know the tools um, to, to move forward. So it's remarkable. You know, those are, those are each such short lists, if you will, you know, three internal obstacles, three external obstacles, and yet there's so much in there. Um, corporate strategy is a challenge. You you hit on something I think we sometimes maybe underestimate in our work and in our field that the cultural change elements of this, of getting everybody on board and getting all the parts of big global organizations aligned is super hard. And then scope three, it's massive to think of managing that appropriately up and down, not just one value chain, but every value chain and where they meet. I won't go through the external challenges cited again, but you know, just just short lists of three, and yet so much work here. So, with any one of those, Elizabeth, where where are you most hopeful that the accelerator might be able to help folks begin to overcome these? Mark, I think we're really focusing the accelerator on really putting out the message to companies that they need to act now and trying to meet the need for the individuals in the companies to act. In other words, thinking about the tools and guidance and active learning that we can do to help the functional leaders within companies do what they need to do. You talked about the broader challenge, and I, I guess I'm really cognizant of the fact that one organization trying to do this work can only do so much. So part of the challenge here with the NETSO or Accelerator is to figure out key partners like ERM to make bigger change happen, right? If if we can bring EDF science and policy expertise, our carbon markets expertise, for example, to the table to shape thought leadership and tools and guidance and put it out there for folks like ERM or other consultancies or other enablers to, to trigger bigger change, we can just help make sure that everyone's doing what the science says needs to, to be done or what needs to be prioritized. So I'd say that's our key focus is action now. The thing I'm most worried about right now is you have a lot of companies that have goals. They need to figure out the plans and the actions to execute on them. But they're, they're lost in uh, consumed by <laughs> measuring and reporting. And, you know, measuring is really important, right? You know, what gets measured gets managed. And it's really important to report and be transparent. The problem is we have run out of time to do that first and then act later. We need companies to be doing that work while also acting now. The messaging, the thought leadership, the guidance that we're putting out for companies in the Nets or Accelerator is really all about what to prioritize now. If you're in a certain sector, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to prioritize. Get going on that right now. Yeah, the action imperative, you know, at the start of our conversation, you were referencing the ticking clock to 2030. And uh, I think in the context of the SDGs set in 2015, we are halfway there. You know, how far are we going to get in delivering the, the broad set of those goals? And specific to the imperative of climate, so many key milestones have to be hit now for us to be able to deliver a low carbon economy and a healthy and a just one by mid century that we just have so much to do um, in the very, very near term. You referenced, and I loved that, that some of the obstacles that had been cited are starting to be overcome, even just because of what's kind of happening around us. So where companies had said government policy and regulation, they need more of it, they need it to push them in this right direction. This year, we got the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act and some things that really helped move that. And of course, there's been a ton happening in Europe, and there's an amazing things happening in other jurisdictions as well. So I think it's about keeping the momentum up, showing progress, keeping hope going. 
um, there is still time to address climate change and we will do it. Um, or we can do it, you know, depending on the choices we make now, we can do it. Um, I just saw Jane Goodall speak with my daughter, um, who's 15. And, um, you know, Jane was called on stage. This was a Wildlife Conservation Network event. It's in a great organization. Jane was called the leading purveyor of hope. And, you know, when I listen to her, I am, I am hopeful. It's like, I, I feel like um, I see this next generation of leaders in my daughter and the youth who are not going to accept anything, but, you know, real leadership and real action on climate. And there, there is no path forward for them um, other than than thinking big and acting big. And I find that very, very hopeful. I'm hopeful about technology. I'm hopeful that, you know, as we, as individuals see the need for acting, you know, things happen, po politics even, policy. So there's a lot of positive momentum. Um, the challenge is still very, very big, but there is a lot of positive momentum. Um Elizabeth, it has been such a pleasure to have this conversation with you today about you, about EDF, about the accelerator, frankly, about your daughter and about Jane Goodall and about what you see in each of those things. I have one final question for you, and it's, it's in very much the spirit of the Sustainable Connections theme of the podcast. If you could connect with anybody in this field, or if you could stick any two organizations together, which connection would you love to see made? Wow, Mark, that is quite a question and such a good question. I'm going to cheat a little bit and respond by saying if I could pick the leaders um, from the top companies in the highest emitting sectors, so the CEOs from those top companies, if I could get them together with a group of youth climate activists and let's have Jane Goodall be in the middle. We'll have <laughs> a, a meeting room in the middle. We'll pull one of the CEOs in, we'll pull one of the youth activists in and Jane will be there um, moderating that because she has been able to create such change and create space. And that's what this is. This needs, you need to have create space so that those CEOs can hear the youth activists vision and, and understand how much they need to change. And the CEOs can talk about what this means and what this means for individuals' lives in a changing economy so that we can think differently and we can all think differently and find a different path forward. What a fantastic answer. Um, we need those bridges between those kinds of leaders and up and coming passionate youth and, and everyone else who will challenge them and demand better. Thanks once again, Elizabeth. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. I look forward to further opportunities to converse, hopefully lots of opportunities to celebrate progress together as well. Bye for now. All right. And as we continue this episode of the Sustainable Connections podcast, I'm really delighted now to welcome my colleague, Matt Haddon. Um, we've just had this conversation with Elizabeth Sturkin of the Environmental Defense Fund, and you've been really central to the relationship that ERM has had with EDF. And we're going to get specifically to some of that work. But first, I want to give you a proper chance to introduce yourself because you're sitting in a really interesting place inside ERM now in terms of confluence of topics, and you've kind of had an interesting journey to get here. And in a sense, that's part of the theme of this Connections too, is how do we connect people who approach this work with different experience, different mindsets, and who are able to make connections across complex organizations, ours included. So please, the, the title if you want, but more the substance of the work. Yeah, it has been an interesting journey. So, so I joined ERM almost 24 years ago now. Um, uh, and interestingly, I've been a journalist before I joined ERM. Uh, and I have all the environmental science background that, that my colleagues at ERM have. But I had a, 
a master's in science communication and it led me to become a, a journalist for a period of six or seven years. And then I got bored. And then this company called the ERM advertised in the back of the paper that I was the news editor for. So <laughs> I applied and several interviews later, I get a job. I realized that consult a chunk of consulting is about um, A, talking with clients, understanding what their problems were, understanding how we might help them solve those problems. And then B, articulating a story to draw the parallel um, about how they could apply the sorts of knowledge that we have as a firm. And ERM has got such a, a breadth of knowledge in all sorts of different spaces to resolve those problems. And so I've, I've devoted my career to, to trying to help companies really take business action as a result of responding to whatever environmental or social or sustainability challenge that they face. Such um, an interesting journey, Matt. And what's exciting about the current portfolio? What what are you doing now at this stage, 20 years on? What's the focus? Well, I, I, I th I, for me, the really interesting thing, Mark, it's almost the last three years. We've had this flip from sustainability is a thing that only sustainability people work on to sustainability is a thing that, you know, the people that really run companies, that really run governments, that really run banks really care about. So we're at this fascinating spot where it's suddenly going to change from being a sideshow to being the main show. Yeah, it's uh, one of the terms that's been bandied about in our field for so long is materiality. And I think it's now that we're really seeing sustainability issues become material across business. And the diversity of voices that I see participating in the conversations today, where the sustainability team still have a role, but the people from IR, the people in finance, the people in legal, the people in operations who are actually embedding this into organizations, that makes it nothing but better and nothing but exciting. With EDF, uh, we've been wrestling with one of the big challenges that companies are facing today, which is the low carbon energy transition uh, and specifically net zero. So you were actually there at the very start of the work that we've engaged with EDF over the course of about the last year to support the development of their net zero accelerator for companies. And we did both surveys and interviews with a group of companies, some dozens of companies. Many of those were our clients. I'm curious what you heard them say about the challenges or obstacles that they face to turning net zero commitments into real performance. Uh, and, and, and in a way, it's um, you put your finger on it earlier, Mark, that we're now moving from a position of the sustainability function in organizations, we're working on sustainability, and now it's everybody else. And so the hypothesis that, that Elizabeth and the EDF, had, EDF team had was lots of companies have made net zero commitments, but not so many are doing anything. And so the, that's the hypothesis. Why? Why is that happening? And what could EDF do to help? One of the things that, that we really noticed that uh, EDF is well placed to work on, in fact, there are three things. The first is the companies are saying they need more subject matter experts. There just aren't enough. And EDF has got a good track record of, of through its climate core, which is a bunch of very smart um, recent graduates, putting those people into organizations to add expertise. So that's one thing. The second thing is, they already have, and they're building even more rapidly, a, a knowledge base of tools and approaches and techniques that companies can pick up and use. And, and one of the things they're looking at with the accelerator is making those available to more people in their, their member client organizations. And the third thing, which is relatively new, is companies have said, we, we need a better understanding of what are the emerging technologies that are going to be available to us over the next three, four, five, ten years as we implement our net zero programs. And so EDF is looking at how do we build a, a, a base of knowledge around when will those technologies become viable so people can start planning towards using them. And so, as you said, we conducted a bunch of interviews, surveyed a bunch of companies, and they really came back with two key gaps or areas of challenge for them. One was, okay, how do we turn a high-level commitment that we might put in a sustainability report or a CEO's statement or mm -hmm. I think they might say on a conference platform into an actual com strategic commercial plan for the organization. How do we turn that commitment into you know, real direction? The second gap was then um, once you've got to that, that plan stage, 
how do you execute it? How do you operationalize it into the lines of business, the different functions that actually run the business day to day? Because mm-hmm. sustainability doesn't run the business day to day. The CEO doesn't run the business day to day. The head of supply chain runs supply chain. The head of procurement runs procurement, operations, logistics, so on and so forth. So you end up with this, this very clear picture that says what's holding us back is we don't know how to really integrate it into our strategic commercial direction. And secondly, if we've got to mobilize now, not, not a five-person sustainability team, but thousands of people that work in these different functional areas, how do we do that? So how do we scale from an idea into a commercial plan into organizational implementation? Makes sense. So I'm actually going to turn those two things, strategy and operationalization back on you in an ERM context, because we're working with clients on those things now. As you try and bring them together inside organizations and help them make that transition from commitment, idea, concept, promise to a commercial strategy and to embed it broadly, is there an example for you of, of what's making that work well, what's making it move forward faster at this point? So, so the way that we're approaching it in ERM, and we've, we've, we've developed this capability over the last few years, is we've been both hiring people that have uh, commercial experience, commercial strategy backgrounds, um, and uniting them with people with scientific backgrounds, very simply, making science relevant to business. So that's, that's, a, that's a chunk of what we've been doing, putting different sorts of people together. So that's, that's the kind of strategic end of it. On the operational end of things, there's a similar kind of mindset. And so, again, we're blending together different combinations of people in two ways. One, one is getting the different scientific disciplines to work together. So understanding how um, uh, climate and, and a GHG emissions and changing those in an organization interacts with the communities around them. So the environmental justice piece. So, so putting different technical disciplines together and um, getting more and more focused on the end users in our, organ- in our client organization. So really understanding how money and operations flow um, in particular sectors, because you can't turn up in a, in a technology company and talk to them in the same way you talk to an oil and gas company or a mining company. You have to understand actually how those organizations work. And increasingly, again, this is the evolution of it, I think, that relates to what's happening with the EDF accelerator program is what does it really mean for the logistics team? who have still got a job of doing logistics. They still have to get stuff from A to B to C, um, but they're going to do it in a way that is reducing emissions as much as possible. They still have a day job. And if you turn up and say, I don't care about your day job, just tell me about your GHG emissions, you're not helping them very much. So being able to work across science and the, and the actual operational implementation is becoming key. Yeah. I can ask one more thing, Matt, and, and, and then probably wrap up for the day. And we've been talking about you know, the work with EDF, the work we do inside companies, uh, and making that grounded and real by connecting it to financial implications for companies. Part of what's happened in the course of the last year and years as well is the external landscape has changed tremendously. We've had policy stemming, especially from Europe for a long time, but the game kind of changed here in the US this year with the IRA and the CHIPS Act, some of these Elizabeth mentioned too. Uh, what's your take on kind of how much of a difference that's making? to have the external environment around companies shift in the way that it is? And what do you think is going to take to keep the wheel turning here and accelerating? Um, I'll, rever- I, I'll answer that in reverse order, I think, Mark. I, I, I don't think there's any going back whatsoever because now we've got, we've got in the form of things like the IRA, we have a, a set of economic policy incentives they will enable the private sector to make money in different ways and that's appealing to all players on the in the economy this isn't about um a bunch of environmentalists or an environmental regulator saying please do this stop stop doing that bad thing 
what, what it's starting to open up. And, and this, this I think, allies to the, the other unstoppable force, which was Wall Street, um, waking up and saying, aha, this is actually about how we make money and avoid losing money. Um, and so it's, it's a pretty fundamental shift. Well, we talked to Elizabeth. She went back to EDF's motto, which is finding ways that work. And I think you might combine those, you know, that, that we're going to continue to find ways that work because there's no going back. I think that's where we're going to leave the podcast today. Appreciate everybody who took the time to listen in and really appreciate, Matt, the chance for this conversation with you. Thanks so very much. Pleasure. To keep connecting and learn more about how ERM is shaping a sustainable future with the world's leading organizations, visit ERM.com and subscribe to the show on your platform of choice. To learn more about the Sustainability Institute, visit sustainability.com. And be sure to join us for our next episode.